It's a wish list, Brady. Given the success, it's a remarkable success of JWST, and the fact it's already producing images that are just stunning the world, and its science is only just beginning, I thought, as a theorist who knows nothing about astronomy, <laughs> I would try and give a, for what, a wish list of, of what it, I would like to try and understand or s see from JWST that will help us cosmologists understand both the universe as it is now, but also the early universe. It's glasses <laughs> see light in the infrared. We can't see infrared, so why is that useful? Because in the very early universe, which it can probe back to, light was emitted from hopefully the first galaxies that were forming and the first stars within the first galaxies. That light probably is in the visible part of the spectrum when it was emitted and in maybe the UV part of the spectrum. But that's 13 billion years ago, 13.4, 13.5 billion years ago only a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. Since that time, as it started on its traverse through the cosmos, the universe has been expanding. And what happens is light that experiences an expansion gets stretched. And so it begins emitted in the visible light, but by the time it's reached us, some 13 billion years later, it's been stretched into the infrared. So no matter how good your Hubble Space Telescope was, or any of your telescopes on Earth that can, un that can see visible light, it would not be able to see that light. Whereas JWST is specifically been made so that the light it picks up is infrared light. In the very early universe, one of the things it's going to try and find evidence for is the first galaxies that were forming. It can see those galaxies forming, it can see because it's got spectrometers it can see the light and then it can break it up into its constituent parts and from that it can see what elements are in those galaxies early on. So it's gaining information about those elements from 13 plus billion years ago. But here's the key thing that I'm particularly interested in, right? Not Clearly if it can see back that far and no one else can, it can also see nearer. And so it can see galaxies forming 13 billion years ago but it can see galaxies then as they were, say, 10 billion years ago, 6 billion years ago, 5 billion years ago. And what you're beginning to get is, as long as you're thinking about the same type of galaxies, you're beginning to understand the evolution of those galaxies. How does a galaxy evolve through time? My hope, <laughs> this is why it's a wish list, is that the, the way a galaxy ev evolves on its large scales will depend on what the background universe is doing, how it's expanding. Well, we know the universe is dominated by one thing today, dark energy. But we don't know what that dark energy is. We think it might be something that is a constant energy contribution throughout the universe, constant energy density, energy per unit volume. That's called a cosmological constant. But it may not. It may be something that has evolved over time and has become much more significant today. My hope is that these two sort of paradigms, one where the dark energy is evolving in time and one where it's effectively constant in time, will lead to subtle but measurable <laughs> differences in how a galaxy evolves. And so what you would need to do is solve your numerical simulations in both of these situations, one where it's evolving in time and one where it isn't. When you do numerical simulations, you're looking at lots and lots of potential galaxies evolving. You hopefully will see some difference, say for example, in the clustering of galaxies, how many they, you form in a given region. Or you might see something different in the size of the galaxies, because dark energy might prevent the galaxies from collapsing depending upon how strong it is in the early universe. So if you might find galaxies are a bit bigger than you were expecting if the dark energy is evolving in time. And because JWST is able to probe so far back and hopefully see lots and lots of examples of very early galaxies, we'll maybe get some decent statistics on, say, the size distribution and the clustering of them. Those will be parameters, numbers, which depend upon the nature of the dark energy. So I can't give you a concrete prediction as to what you might find. And my, my guess would be, with a cosmological constant, that they, they are going to be sort of um, maybe a bit bigger 
than, than without the cosmological constant, simply because it, it, its presence might be more significant early on. Okay, so, so I've got my galaxies. I'm, I'm trying to understand the dynamics of those. Then if I look at, say, the center of a galaxy, one thing we know about the center of the galaxy is every galaxy that's been observed has a supermassive black hole in it. Sagittarius A is the famous one in the Milky Way, and that's got a, ma a mass of about a million times the mass of the sun. The question is, what, what's the seed? What led into what became the center of the galaxy, which could then accrete enough matter to give you a, a billion solar masses? One possibility is that the seed could have come from the very early universe. In the very early universe, uh, much earlier than this, there are these objects that could, in principle, form that are very massive, cosmic strings, that can be small loops of string which can form and they can have masses which are quite easily big enough to accomplish this thing of the seed mass. I have to admit, they're not the favoured way forward. Those people that work on this day in, day out say, no, you don't need to be so exotic. <laughs> you can work with standard sort of astrophysics and pinch this, tweak that a little bit and you can get it. But here's the question, right? Imagine JWST keeps seeing masses close to a million solar masses back at 13.4 billion years ago. In other words, those first galaxies that are forming are already have this supermassive black hole in the center. And imagine if they keep seeing it. Then the question arises, is there enough time for you know, that seed mass to have been there using standard astrophysics? Or do I need some other more exotic particle physics origin, which is where I would come in and go, yeah. That's what I'm looking for. So, so, so the second thing on my wish list is that we can begin to probe the core of a galaxy and see how massive it is as we go further and further back. And if so, you eventually go far enough back that you haven't, you've just simply haven't had enough time to form that from conventional astrophysics. That's my hope. <laughs> so the third thing that I think I would really like to understand is what happens to the supernovae as I go back in time. So the type 1a supernovae, which are the white dwarves that, that, that accrete enough matter that they then can form a supernovae, they use as standard candles. And that's the way that we actually have been determining how the universe is accelerating, one of the key ways. But we can only probe it at the moment out to a certain distance scale, a distant redshift, it's of order 1. And when you look at the different models of dark energy and ask what does this luminosity, the brightness of these objects, how does it look as a function of the redshift, how far away, all the models look fairly similar out to a redshift of, of, of one or so. But the models then begin to differ quite considerably once you go past the redshift of one because they, they, they experience the matter-dominated part of the universe differently. One is the dark energy is a cosmological constant. It experiences the dark. Its contribution to the overall budget in a, is a constant. But the, the ones with the um, e evolving equations of state, they can actually, they'll tail off compared to the cosmological constant. And so what you will see is a turnaround from the acceleration that we experience today as we go back in redshift, the universe stops accelerating. We're going back in time, remember. The universe stops accelerating and goes into what's called a matter-dominated universe. That's where the structures form. That transition from the acceleration into the matter domination relies on the type of dark energy. And I, my hope, <laughs> my third part of the wish list, is that the JWST will actually find enough supernovae going out through that regime, they'll find lots and lots I think, so that it will be able to definitively give us the profile of the luminosity and then we can fit it with our models. So it's sort of like you'll be able to recalibrate those standard candles and continue using them as standard continue candles. Continue using them as standard candles all the way out to a much deeper distance and then that I think will provide us with a, a really good handle on whether or not the dark energy is evolving in time or whether or not it's a constant. That would be a massive result. There is a fourth thing if you, which is kind of linked, but it's a real wish-wish list, <laughs> a wish squared. There have been papers recently which suggest there's another type of standard candle that we could think about, and these are quasars. Right? Quasars are supermassive black holes. Sort of going berserk and, and they can be found at really large redshifts. 
I think there's a lot of controversy whether they really are standard candles. But if they are, if there is a way of representing them as standard candles, then they, that's another way of probing deep into the universe. And JWST, because it can see these massive, supermassive black holes, it'll be able to probe all the way out to these large, large redshifts, you know, taking us back to 13 billion years. Number five, could it tell us something about the nature of dark matter and the nature of some of the supermassive stars that might be present in the early universe? Supermassive stars? Yeah, there could be really big stars that are present that could, in principle, have come, been formed not from the sort of material we're used to, but from the scale of fields arising from the very early universe, from inflation. And there are stars that theorists like myself have worked on called boson stars, which are, are formed in the very early universe. Axion stars is another type. You can make sure that they're the sort of size that you expect of stars. And the question is, could we see any evidence for that in the very early universe, which JWST might be picking up? One of the things I've taken from your wish list is you really want to know how different the dark energy regime was back then yeah. to what it's like now. Yeah. You want to compare the two. Yeah. Why would the dark energy regime be so different yeah. back in the early, early days? Okay, okay, my own prejudice is now coming in. All right, uh, I admit. Um, I work on a, an area, I have done a lot of work on an area called uh, um, scaling solutions. Okay, what does that mean? That means I have um, some field evolving and it evolves in such a way that it gets a, it, be, it mimics whatever the background is doing and in the early universe just a very brief reminder the early universe sort of has a radiation dominated pe period where the energy density is dominated by radiation then it goes into a matter dominated area when the bulk of structures form and then it comes into the dark energy dominated regime where we're accelerating this scalar field type model has the property that it just mimics whatever is dominating at the time. A cosmological constant is a constant all the way back here in time. This one, remember, I've, I've had it so that it, it, it matches a cosmological constant today, but earlier on it could have been bigger because it was tracking, it's called tracking, following the matter, then following the radiation. So this idea of being able to see the influence over time is coming from a, a, a prejudice of mine <laughs> that I think if there are scalar fields in the early universe, they can have this property, which is a really nice property. It's called an attractor solution, where it, it finds what's dominating and it goes, I'll have a bit of that, and it'll follow it. And then it switches and it says, I'll have a bit of that matter dominated bit, and it follows that. And we, we don't know if the universe did that or not. And I'm hoping You've hit the, come to the nucleus of it, I'm hoping JWST can see some evidence of it. <laughs> That's what I would really like. What there is, it's a remarkably nondescript star. I suspect it was chosen probably because it's fairly boring, right? It's not, you know, it's not so bright that it would uh, sort of blind the telescope. It's not so faint that they wouldn't actually be able to use it to focus the telescope with. It's got no companions, so you can get a nice sharp image of an individual star. Has it got a cool name? 